Here we are to talk aviation again. Paul Brennan in Wellington and... Uh, Martin Oaks in Wellington. How are you doing there, Martin? I'm doing all right, thank you. Yes? Yep. Now, um, let's get on to the uh, matter in hand. Uh, where do we start? MH370. I see there's talk of turning off the search in a couple of months. They're going to give up, aren't they? Yes. Um, under the international agreements they have regarding searches for missing aircraft, um, the time is just about up and the Australians are signalling that there's probably not much point anymore. The most recent stage of the search, they've turned off looking for pinpoint artefacts or whatever it is, and they've turned on a broadband search which would look for very large chunks of metal. Um, turns out there's lots of very large chunks of metal under the ocean, um, containers, bits of boats, a surprising amount of debris in the oceans, yes. not all of which was dumped there. They think the deep ocean currents do have the ability to move stuff Right. thousands of miles over its and, lifetime. And maybe gather it together too. In trenches and things like this. Yeah. And yeah, basically the Aussies are signalling that there's probably not much point anymore. But are they in the right place? Again, the guy who saw it from the oil rig near Vietnam has been reported in the last week or so as saying he's sure about what he saw. That's in a completely different part, well, not of the world, but way away from the current search. So, you know, and are, in quite are, we, a, are we ever going to know? And in quite a likely part of the world, actually, considering yeah. the plane was on its way to China and they've worked out that where he thinks he saw it, it was on the flight path to Beijing. And this is a guy who's been at sea for most of his life. He was very particular about recording where he was, the direction he was pointing in, the angle that he thought he saw this flaming debris falling out of the sky. The Vietnamese obviously took it seriously for a little while because they sent Navy ships to the area. Etc. 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 But still nothing found. No. My, mind you, their search may not have been very comprehensive. No. So why are they staying away from there? I, because either you're really sure that your data, the data you're working with from the satellite company and the number crunches and the algorithm writers have got it right, or you're blindly ignoring another possibility and not following it up. I, I sort of don't quite understand. Hence the blossoming of all these conspiracy theories, I guess. It just seems a bit too convenient to be true, doesn't oh, it? Yeah, and then there was the story um, put forward or a theory put forward by somebody of it being buried in some... Kazakhstan. ...ex-cosmodrome um, somewhere. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and, 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 and yeah, at the landing base for the Buran um, Russian space shuttle. Oh. And he's identified this field that was in his mind, very suspiciously ploughed up prior to the accident and then a hole dug and then filled in after the accident. And when he superimposes the shape of a 777-200ER over this... It all makes sense. It yeah. all fits and blah, blah, blah. But but why? Exactly. Why, but, why but, would you do that? And, and, and then this comes back to the fact that the Malaysians are either completely incompetent or are purposely not saying anything that's a fine line perhaps i don't know the conspiracies are feeding off this big holes dug the malaysians are appearing not to be able to or to want to tell hmm. anything hmm. and you know people giving up searches and all this type of thing it is a fertile ground i, I personally sure doubt it but there you go there's just not enough officially to look like uh, they're covering all the bases. Hmm. And anyone with any common sense would, would say that you can't ignore actual sightings from, like you say, credible people who are used to being out in the environment and seeing the quirks and uh, phenomenon of nature. So it can sort of put that filter on it. You've got to give some credibility to that. Yeah. Well, well, fair enough. They, they've sort of just ignored it. like it. If, if flaming happen. debris was falling out of the sky, shouldn't we be after knowing what that was? Well, Maybe it wasn't the plane, but what was it? Yeah, considering that night a plane went missing and they haven't found it. Exactly. Uh, yeah, you'd say that that was uh, definitely something worth following up, Yeah, requiring more investigation. And it was in the gulf between Thailand and South Vietnam, roughly where the plane would have made landfall had it been on its way yeah, to so Beijing. so it wasn't out of the question that it could be there. So maybe someone did shoot it down, Paul, and it's well, all it's a monstrous cover-up. Okay, there's some shame in, in covering it up initially, but, you know... In the end, why, why can't you just admit, oh, well, I'm sorry, we shot it. A terrible mistake, you know. Mistakes happen. Why not just admit it? Loss of face. Hey, I'm becoming conspiracy theorist well, here. Well, it's a loss of face anyway. They all look like they're incompetent. <laughs> yes. So, you know, you can't win, yeah. can you? Well, there'll be a loss of face then to admit that and have a further loss. There's all degrees of loss of face here, Paul. I don't think we understand it. 
Oh, well, I don't. That's for sure. <laughs> okay, so um, let's um, maybe not make a prediction, but say it's likely that they'll just run out of time and they'll say, well, we can't find it. It's almost an impossible task. No one's prepared to fund it anymore. It's an accident. It's been declared as such. Insurance has paid the people out. Moving on. Yeah, I think that's what they're angling for. Yeah. No one still knows what happened. No one knows if that was an oxygen fire that could occur again in the cockpit of a 777 or a nose wheel fire. That it, no one knows that. Yeah. All right. So uh, where do we go to next? Big turnaround for Qantas. They're in profit now. Over 300 million. All of a sudden, people are reacting like it's been uh, like magic. Someone waved the wand. Alan Joyce waved the wand and magically they're back in profit. But I mean... People have been expecting this uh, for a while, haven't they? They've laid off thousands of people. They've got rid of a whole lot of uh, old aircraft. So you'd expect some saving from that. Yes, sooner or later, accounting and reality will catch up and you'll post a profit if you remove a whole lot of costs from your organisation. Yeah, like an entire fleet of gas-guzzling 767s and the thousands of people related to its operation. There you go. And that's what they did. And that's all they've done. And now they're making money. Good on them. Yeah. What else has happened, though? Fuel price has gone down. I have no insight into how quickly that would have had effect within Qantas with all their hedging and stored fuel and all this type of thing. But obviously, maybe they've taken away um, provisions they were making for a high fuel price and they can put that back on the other side of the column. Yeah, I mean, it's bound to happen sooner or later. Qantas saves money. They end up making money. That's what's happened. Um, It's good. Though you've got to think about a business that makes money from constantly lowering overhead and not expanding earnings. Well, that'll be their next challenge. That's what you would really have to see to know that it's for real, right? Yes. How long can this persist? What can they do to start earning a lot of money? Um, good news is, or possible good news is, they've decided to exercise some of their 787-900 options, which will enable them to take even more older planes out of the fleet. Yeah. Time will tell, but I'm pretty sure they'll make a bit of money for the next few years should fuel prices stay low. Their load factors appear to be high, cutting back an unprofitable routes. They're now thinking of expanding into some more European destinations, which should help them, and try and claw back some custom from Emirates, because a lot of people have jumped ship. And yes, time will tell. Once they get more efficient planes and a, a better business plan, maybe it will persist. I wonder how long Mr. Joyce is going to be there. Yes, well, in, in normally um, his bonus will be tied directly to ah. how much money they make, so he'll try and get another great year in next year and yeah. he'll probably wander off. He's already figured out how to get next year's bonus. Yeah. He's got a strategy yeah. well, for it. His bonus will be tied to two years of um, performance, no doubt. Yeah. Yeah, you, you stop cutting overheads, now make some money. Yeah. All right, so there we go. We'll watch that space. The flying kangaroo is still in the air. Still bouncing along. It's still bouncing along, but it's not getting any easier, is it? I mean, let's face it. The competitive um, industry out there is just getting more and more competitive. And for them, the, the, how do you say, the watershed will be how much custom has decided that Emirates is nicer for their um, occasional overseas holidays and how many of them they can get back to flying with the uh, kangaroo. Well, we'll see. Hmm. So we've been talking about the air services that have come in to fill the, I guess, gap, vacuum, whatever you want to call it, caused by Air New Zealand announcing the withdrawal of their Beach C-1900Ds, the Eagle Air-operated aircraft, and uh, the latest operator to come forward would be operator Kiwi Regional Air, which uh, is has been set up by the founder of the former Kiwi Air, Ewan Wilson, Hamilton-based <laughs> businessman. And he's talking, Martin, about air services out of Hamilton to Tauranga, Blenheim, Queenstown, Nelson. He seems to be very confident. I've been reading a story appearing on the Stuff uh, website uh, just in the last week or so. He appears very confident and relaxed about what he's doing, which you, you get the impression that he's pretty well down the track and figured most of this out, and he must have some deals in place, otherwise he wouldn't be talking like this. Of course, he's Hamilton-based, and the Beach 1900 fleet is Hamilton-based as well. I wonder if we'll see him taking over some of those aircraft from Eagle Air and sort of uh, using the people that already operate them now to sort of seamlessly transfer it over to a new operation and then pursue these cities which uh, Air New Zealand don't fly between. What do you make of this? Is he on to something or has he left his move too late? Well, I think he's left it a little late. If he could have had this going two, three months ago, or at least have it all announced and planned up, he would have taken a lot of the wind of this out of the sails of the people that have already sprung up and taken yeah. some of this market. And very, I mean, you know, look at um, Sounds Air, Air Chathams and all these guys, they've, they've really jumped into it quickly. Well, Sounds Air possibly have the ability to uh, compete here with this sort of idea of, uh, of connecting the cities that we just mentioned. 
if they've got enough PC12s, doing it with Convairs is not viable. You no. might have to do a one-off. So really, it's, it's those two that will be competing, it seems, here eventually, or maybe even route for route. We'll see how it develops. So he'll have to have a minimum of PC12, won't he? to compete with Sounds Air. And that gives you, a what, nine, ten seats? Nine, ten seats, You're yes. going to probably need more than that to make a go of those city pairs that he, he's talking about. Well, I agree with you. Being Hamilton-based, where the current Eagle Air fleet is based, he must have done a deal to take over those Beach 1900s. Well, maybe some of them, not all of them, because I think yeah. there are 19 or 20 of them. Some There's of them, or, or if they won't give them to him, he's managed to source some somewhere else. The key there is to have a base which is familiar with that aircraft, yeah. have staff familiar with that aircraft, and a country yeah. and airports which are familiar with that aircraft that well, he can you know, get off the example, ground quickly. For example, the chief pilot could easily just transfer to the new operation mm. and nothing would change. Mm. And CAA would be confident in certifying that if the same people are involved if there's enough capital behind it. But if you're getting the aircraft at fire sale, there's not a huge demand for Beach 1900Ds now. There's not really a place for them in airline service. Hmm. The smaller regional jets sort of killed them off, didn't they? So uh, you might as well either, what, you scrap them or you sell them off cheap to someone who wants to operate them like he might want to. I think watch that space. I'll be interested to see how that develops. As you say, he did, what, four, five or six of them, and he could probably cover most of the routes he's talking about. And he's got 19 seats. Yeah. And he's fast, 258 knots. E- expensive to run, which is probably the reason Air New Zealand's getting rid of them. Well, they're 620 US dollars on fuel and oil, direct operating cost, no labor, no airport charges, nothing. So you're probably looking at around the 1500 1600 Kiwi dollars per hour to operate. So do the math. Hmm. And uh, also locally, the Dash 8s are going to go, I see, Martin. And New Zealand going to replace them with ATR-72s. They're going to, I think, bring in another 13, did I read? Uh, That'll be interesting to see what happens to Air Nelson because that's the uh, historic base for what is currently the Dash 8 operation. If they retire that fleet, naturally, uh, ATR operations are out of Christchurch. It goes there. Nelson could be facing the closure of... uh, quite a part of the local industry well, there. Yeah, what would be the point of maintaining two aircraft bases on the South Island, eh? Absolutely. Mm. And when you're already set up, you've, you've been doing ATR maintenance at Christchurch for, what, 15, 20 years now? On a plane which does now require maintenance, whereas the ATRs, most of them will be brand new. A lot mm. of them won't require maintenance or very much maintenance. Just, just line stuff. For the stuff. first years, yep. Yeah. So um, I'd be a bit worried if I was Nelson. Uh, not too much talk about that flow on, but surely that is the natural consequence unless... Again, there's been some sort of deal done or will be with the local government to keep them there, but I, I can't see how that could work. What would the point be? What would the point be? For the for the operator, obviously for the city it would be a great thing, but, you know... You become it, a Dash 8 overhaul base in the world? I mean, there's no, no, trying no, to send them all the way out here? That won't happen. No. So uh, they could be finished there. Mm-hmm. That's something to uh, bear in mind. Again, keep an eye on that. Avalon uh, Air Show at Geelong, I've attended one of those uh, back in around, I think it was 2001, Martin, Interesting, we were talking about the A400, the Airbus A400 military transporter. Big turboprop, swept wing, carbon fibre, state-of-the-art, fly-by-wire. There was a quote in one of the opinion pieces related to the appearance of that aircraft at the Avalon Show in Geelong that I reckon came from us. It, it sounds strikingly similar. When we were talking about the A400 potential for RNZAF, what, about a month or two ago? Yeah, we brought up um, <laughs> Antarctica and the islands, and the wording we used was, <laughs> interestingly enough, almost exactly the same as the wording used in this um, piece put out. It was actually a piece put out by the Airbus guys. Yeah, that's right. So um, maybe they did a search for any talk of that sort of uh, content down in this part of the world, and maybe they, you know, thanks to YouTube tags... It was very close to what we said. So uh, I, I did think it was a very interesting, the fact that he used the term the islands, because most people who are not in New Zealand would never refer to the Pacific like that. No, no. They'd call it the Pacific or the Pacific well, Islands. Well, or that, yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, and obviously there is going to be a pitch. They're going to try and interest um, our good uh, folk of the Air Force in the A400. Well, they are targeting, and, and good on them. They are targeting extra sales this year. They've said that. That's why they send the French down to Avalon. And I'm sure there'll be 
New Zealand Air Force as well as Australian Air Force crawling all over this thing. It'll be interesting to see what the uh, press, the aviation press say about that and to see if the politicians in this country and the Air Force brass start to talk about that A400 uh, subsequent to their test flying and the, the demonstration. I in, imagine there will be some mention of it. It would be interesting um, to investigate the commonality between the flight control system and the diagnostic systems between the A400 and the A320 because apparently they are related to some extent. Yeah, well, they'd be absolutely similar, wouldn't they? It'd be wow. same software, same uh, fundamental boxes. I guess some of them have military what uh, hardware protection on them or a higher grade of construction for some of the equipment. Some of it would be classified, but primarily it would be the same for flying. You'd, you'd think it? so, yes. Yeah. Certainly the test equipment and all that would be very similar. Yeah. So uh, look out for some mentions of the A400. It'll just be a matter of price, I think, and how much um, our country wants to or cuddle up to the Americans and... Take those white tail C 17s. The last one of which had its wing to fuselage join this week. So, th- and that's it out of production after that. Done. Uh, from Long Beach. Yeah, and the California. closure of that factory. Well, somebody will use it. Um, yeah, for something. It'll become uh, one of those storage uh, paintball places, and then they'll have a program like. It's like the, 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 the Long the, Beach storage auctions. The New Zealand car industry. It's hardware stores, paintball, or go kart tracks, yeah, no, isn't go, it? Yeah, go kart tracks. Yeah. That's a lot of fun. Yeah. For good corporate team building out. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. We're going to downside. Let's go over a go kart race. Yeah, and talk about it. <laughs> and uh, bond together. Irony and Americans don't normally go together, but um, interesting piece this week. Atlanta offers a fuel tax rebate. In fact, there is no tax on aviation fuel at Atlanta. Right. Now, the government of Georgia, the good state of Georgia, are thinking of reinstating that tax because they want a bit of money. And oh. the irony here is the Delta is most upset and they're going to petition everybody in sight not to remove that subsidy on their operations. This is particularly rich given that Delta are so anti-subsidies that they've been having a really good go at the Middle Eastern Three. Yes, haven't they? Due to the amount of subsidies they apparently receive. Now, no. the Middle Eastern Three deny getting any subsidies, and they say there's a big difference between subsidies and investment. So what if the royal family invests in us? They're not giving us the money. They're expecting a return. Yeah. And plus, yes, we might have low costs at our operating base, but it's not a monopoly. Any airline is free to operate in Dubai. Apparently, there is a difference because... Delta feel that getting cheaper fuel subsidised by the Georgian state is not a subsidy in any way. Ah. Yes, conveniently. Yeah, because they're the biggest user of that airport too, yes. so they're the biggest gas user. 62% or something of this break goes directly to Delta. Other airlines operating out of the states don't get it. Yeah. They need to be careful, don't they, the American carriers, in how much they try and, uh, I don't know, criticise or critique the Middle Eastern carriers because... People are conscious of the fact that they're huge orderers of aircraft Mm. and some of those orders literally underpin the viability year to year of Boeing, particularly on the 777 line and Airbus. Yeah, the A380 just wouldn't be anything without Emirates. They don't want to be damaging the ability to sell these high value products to these other countries so they, they they need to be very diplomatic don't they yeah it wouldn't it wouldn't take much for um emirates to send a very clear lesson to the american government let's say they cancelled half of their 150 triple seven x order yeah well that's people out of jobs mm. for decades yes possibly mm. and also you know um if an order you've got a big enough order it underpins the viability of the entire product range and you know, now it literally allows you to sell more anyway yes. so I wonder what uh, happens in the Boeing boardroom or the Airbus boardroom when people start talking like that. Well, Boeing has been very much on the side of the air of Emirates. Right. Well, they have to be. Yeah. Yes, they know what side they're. They'd spend more with with Emirates would spend more with Boeing than Delta does, wouldn't they? Yes, I mean Emirates spends an awful lot of money, as we know. Also, thanks to the Import Export Finance Bank. Uh There you go. (laughs) Which is also not a subsidy. Yeah. By the way, but then also while you're saying that Delta are ordering European Airbuses, and they're probably then they're probably taking advantage of the financing that Airbus offers. So there you go. So as as the um, who do you believe? The chairman of Emirates said he said if you design nicer product, more people might fly with you, and I suspect he's right because. I've said this a few times, but I have I have had some pretty awful experiences in some United planes. But Americans tolerate, I don't mean to sound uh, disparaging, but a, a degree of shabbiness. You know, you think about those very middle-of-the-road sort of um, corporate branded roadside restaurants. They're sort of nice, but they're sort of not that nice. No, they're sort of horrible, actually. It's, that's sort of the standard for everything, you know? Yeah. Yeah, I, I, I went in a 777-200, um, non-ER, 
yeah. from um, oh, yeah. Los Angeles to Washington, D.C., and the flight was then going on to Brussels. I thought it was in the 70s. There you go. It was yeah. horrible. Yeah. But no one sort of seems to mind too much. Dirty and, and grimy. And, and and there seems to be an element of patriotism flying them still. Yeah. Fly the friendly skies. Yeah. When was the last time they were friendly? <laughs> really. All full. This plane that I was on was half empty. Well, there you go. People vote with their feet, don't they? Yeah, they were all waiting for the Emirates flight. And speaking of Emirates, just quickly, uh, talking about more A380 routes. I see Glasgow and Gatwick are on their hit list now. Amazing, isn't it? Unstoppable force. Yes. What will that do? <laughs> It'll upset British Airways, that's for sure. Yeah. British Airways have been spying on their staff for about the last three or four years. Well, why wouldn't you? That sort of smacks of paranoia a bit, doesn't it? It does, and it always backfires, and it never has the desired effect, or whatever that was, and it was probably the desired outcome is probably the wrong one anyway. Yeah. But you just wonder why they bother. A couple of first flights, and we can talk about uh, one in just a moment as our aircraft of the day. But another one this week, the anniversary, I think it was this week back in 1936 of the first flight of the Hindenburg airship. 803 feet long, Martin, 135 feet wide. And uh, it had, uh, I think, about 7 million cubic feet of gas on board. Just massive dimensions, even by today's standards. Imagine that thing coming over the city. It'd be like an overcast. Yeah, it'd be like one of those weird sci-fi movies where a spaceship arrives above the the skyscrapers. We're taking over. Yeah, you know, it's that big. It's like a super tanker-sized thing in the sky. And uh, apparently, we know that it ended disastrously, uh, the thing burning at New Jersey, Lakehurst, New Jersey, just a year after it first flew. But boy, imagine flying on that thing across the Atlantic, travelling on on that vehicle it must have been amazing like literally like a ship in the sky yeah trundling along at what 70 miles an hour on the promenade deck they had um a specially built aluminium piano so that you could have music with your dinner lovely passageways cabins yeah um there was an observation blister up on the top you could take an elevator up to the top a very small elevator i think it was just one at a time you could go up to the top and 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 look around yes just just the most amazing thing and quite controllable, quite manoeuvrable. They had the the gondola underneath where the control cabin was, and that almost looked like some sort of Jules Verne. It looked very steampunk, didn't it? <laughs> I've I've been to the Zeppelin Museum in Friedrichshafen on oh, the wow. Lake of Constance because Zeppelin actually came from the town where I used to live in Germany, and um, it is a steampunk delight in there. All the old furniture and the way they they made stuff and. You know, the cutlery, the silverware, for the t- everything was designed yeah. for lightness and was hyper-modern and, and really good-looking. Yeah. Aluminium throughout and duralumin um, structure. That's right. Lots of aluminium. And, of course, it was the aluminium and the dope over the envelope fabric, which actually caused all the problems. Which uh, was responsible for that incredible newsreel footage shot on the day. Mm. And also the commentary, which spawned that sort of 20th century icon quote, news quote, Oh, the Humanity. Yes. By Herbert Morrison, the reporter. It's just amazing that anybody came out of that alive. Yeah. Quickly, our aircraft of the day, another aircraft that was taking to the air, how many years ago this week? 2nd of March, 1969. The 747 was the queen of the skies. Do we have a, a sort of a label that we can give this aircraft? I would actually say this was the queen of the skies and the 747 would be the king of the skies. <laughs> okay. Because this is much nicer looking. Yeah. We're talking, of course, about the first supersonic airliner to go into commercial service. It wasn't the first one to fly, but it was the first one to go into commercial service. And we're talking about the... Uh, Concorde. Of course. Beautiful aircraft. Um, they say it's a fusion of art and design. It's certainly when you look at the close-up of the, the leading edge of the wing, how it curves, and it's just amazing that they built these things in the 60s. Mm, and um, there's plenty of uh, interviews and everything on uh, YouTube of pilots who flew them who said it was a very good aircraft to fly. Really responsive, really stable, very predictable. Most of them never even had a failure. There's some fascinating videos on YouTube, particularly that one where they're coming out of JFK and doing that um, low-noise departure. The Kanazi departure Man. Called, yeah. he takes off and I don't know how low they are but they stand it on the wing don't they well that was designed to get over the noise objections from the locals Man, and it turned out that um, put the aircraft well within limits doing that departure but yeah dramatic you're in the turn I think at about 150 feet after yeah. departure and and, and he just it doesn't look like it's got enough wing to hold itself the up the thing powers out though well I can attest to that because I worked in an office in um, Virginia 
sort of parallel with the Dulles. Oh yeah, they had a service to Dulles. They used to have a service to Dulles in the early to mid 90s. You certainly knew when Concord took off because they could take off straight out on that one. Yeah. They didn't have to do any um, low noise turns right. or anything. Yeah, yeah. And four after burning turbo jets. You'd hear the noise and you'd all go to the window and you'd watch it streaking off. Well, it didn't streak off. Um, it was low and flat for a few miles and then it just suddenly rocketed off. Yeah. Uh, the thing about the aircraft is that um, the first prototypes were smaller, I think, than the production yes. planes. and. They were just really proof of concept, weren't they? So they, they built 20, and I think the first six were non-airline aircraft yeah. of varying configurations and sizes. Yeah. And then it was um, 14 went into service. And I think the Rolls-Royce Olympus engine was chosen as the power plant. Of course, flew on the Vulcan bomber, so a well-known entity. And it was all about uh, slowing that air down into the intakes of the engine with those uh, movable ramps. And I don't think they needed afterburner to maintain supersonic flight. No, they had thing. they had super cruise before the term had even been coined. Yeah, so it was always in the climb, and I think there was a calculated point of descent, which was the top of the climb, so it would just go up to the descent point and then come down again. I don't think there was any level flight as such, was there? Yeah, no, it was a very gentle climb the whole way, yeah. Up to 60,000 feet, I believe. Yep. You can see the curvature of the Earth, Mach 2. The longest putt in history was done on a Concorde. Okay. They putted it up the aisle, and by the time it got to the uh, front of the cabin, it had travelled 8.3 nautical miles. Oh, there you go. At Mach 2. The crash at um, Charles de Gaulle sealed its fate. That was unfortunate because they'd just um, grounded them and then done them all up and lined the tanks with Kevlar, put new tyres on them and upgraded them quite a bit, and they only went on for another year and a bit. Yes, a huge waste of money and effort and quite sad to see it sort of, you know, the demise happen in that way. And there's all sorts of um, reasons that accident should not have happened regardless of the debris on the runway. Apparently the centre of gravity was off due to the plane being incorrectly loaded. They think if the plane had been loaded properly, it would have probably have recovered. Really? Yeah, it would have been on fire, but it would, could have probably landed. Yeah, yeah. well, uh, the contention is, was it on fire later or earlier in the takeoff run mm. because that has a bearing on whether that uh, continental plane had anything to do with it with that strip of men I, I really never bought that it's it's too small it didn't look very big it's did a it? tiny little strip yeah. of titanium i know it's still controversial so the only place you can see a concord now is at a museum i don't think they'll ever be even though they probably could be restored to a flyable condition it's not going to happen no so we're never going to see that again i'd be surprised if we see supersonic air travel in our lifetimes actually all right, so the Concorde, our aircraft of the day, and that brings us to the end of another program on aviation. It's goodbye from me until uh, the next time we talk, and... Goodbye from me. See ya. Cheers.